Hi, I'm Oliver Gao. I am the director of Cornell System Engineering Program, and I have been conducting these uh, system conversations with our Ezra seminar uh, speaker speakers that come to give our talks about you know systems. So today we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Neil Lewis Jr who is an assistant professor of communication and uh, social behavior at Cornell University with graduate field appointment in communication and uh, psychology. He is also a faculty affiliated with Cornell Center for the study of uh, inequity, Robert Center for Public Opinion Research at Cornell. So, you know, Professor Lewis' research examines how and why people's identities and uh, social contexts interact to influence their motivation to pursue their goals and success in achieving them. So I know like, you know, uh, Neil has been doing so much uh, excellent work looking at social disparities. So actually this is something very exciting and very important to our society. So Neil, welcome to our systems conversations. Thank you for having me. I'm yeah. really um, excited to have the opportunity to come and uh, to share some of my work with the group and get some feedback on um, how you all think about this, these topics as well. You know, wonderful, of course, in the case, as you are like, you know, we, me, and also probably audience look, watching this, we are very interested in knowing more about you and your work. So would you like start this by telling more about yourself? Sure, yeah, so um, I did my undergraduate research here, at, um, at my undergraduate um, studies here at Cornell. Um, I studied economics and psychology. Um, and my sort of thinking about systems really started then um, when I was an undergraduate member of the Cornell Formula racing team with Al George who was our faculty advisor um, who is also um, here in systems. Um, so that's where I started thinking about a lot of the issues that I'll talk about today um, and sort of inspired a lot of my thinking going into graduate school. So from here I went to the University of Michigan to get my PhD in social psychology um, and done a lot of work on disparities in a variety of um, areas. Uh, most of my work focuses on disparities in education, health, and environmental outcomes. And so that's sort of broadly uh, what I've been uh, doing in my work. You know, I think that, that, that's where I, I remember reading somewhere, actually, you are the first generation college graduate. Yes. Uh, your family and uh, and I think kind of probably you know your research even has a deep root mm -hmm. uh, from your own experience yes. and I think in your uh, I was reading I think uh, you wrote that even though the society and the people we have realized uh, there is this value of increasing number of the STEM graduate students however universities mm -hmm. where we are struggling mm -hmm. uh, to either enroll more or retain uh, the STEM students, mm -hmm. uh, for example, for honorable representing minorities and uh, particularly women. Yeah. So why? Why so, is this, you know, why, you know, we're doing so much, we're making so much effort, but why is this phenomenon still a challenge? Yeah, I, I think um, a big part of the challenge is um, understanding the social dynamics that happen when the students are here. So universities are putting a lot of efforts into recruiting, um, which is really great. Um, but then we've got to think about what those students' experiences are like when they're here. Um, what, how are sort of people treating them when they're interacting uh, in groups? So that's part of what I'll talk about today is um, work on sort of how men versus women are treated differently in engineering team settings. Um, we get similar kinds of um, processes emerging when you look at racial ethnic minorities um, versus uh, more dominant groups. Uh, people are sort of treated differently in these groups and that affects outcomes, right? It, if you're in a situation um, repeatedly where this, um, the society, the groups, give you signals that, well, maybe you don't belong here as much, that can undermine your intention to stay. So if you don't feel like you belong, um, you'll be less likely to stay in these programs. And that's one of the things we've been finding in some of our work. Um, and so we've been looking at um, these processes by studying teams of engineers, um, as I'll talk about today, mm -hmm. um, following, including one study where we actually followed students from the time they uh, got to college until the time they left. 
looked at their experiences um, along the way and what predicted whether or not they stayed or, uh, or left. And then more recently, I've been tr trying to think about interventions to try and reduce some of those gaps. I think that's so important. So, and I, th I think you probably, you mentioned, you know, some, uh, some method you use for this research. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're conducting kind of longitudinal study following mm -hmm. up with a sample yeah. subjects. So that kind of reminds me, you know, the, the Harvard study of happiness. Okay. Right, they, I remember watching the YouTube video saying that there fell, you know, they were following these people from they were born or something mm -hmm. until they were in se you know, past 75 years oh, wow. uh, yeah. of something. And I think in the end of their conclusion is that you know, the ha one key factor for happiness is about relationship. Yes. It's not really about how rich or how poor a person is. Right? Relationship yeah. with the family men, relationship with the colleagues, relationship with, with the society. Yeah. So, so with that, and for you to study this kind of social uh, disparity you know, either among different income levels or across gender. Mm -hmm. So, one thing I think you said that in the in our education community, we have trying to be uh, shifting from the pedag pedagogic approach to include this project based mm -hmm. team learning yeah. in the group setting. Yeah. So in that kind of uh, you know team based learning in group setting, so. What did people find out? What did the researchers find out? Yeah, so um, the, there's been a shift towards uh, groups, particularly in science um, education. Um, engineering sort of is at the forefront of that. Um, so much of the curriculum now is uh, putting students into teams that they work um, with sort of along the way. And this produces lots of benefits. Um, so students can learn a lot from each other by working on problems together. Um, and so that's been sort of the, that was a big part of the motivation for shifting to that approach. Um, but what we've been finding lately is not everyone benefits equally from this, right? Um, so depending on how roles get assigned in these teams, um, so who gets to um, take on, say, the more technical roles in an engineering context, um, doing the design, the analysis, um, calculations, versus more non-technical roles, scheduling the meetings, uh, taking notes for the team, et cetera, um, you get differential benefits from being on those teams. Um, and so what we've been finding there is you often get um, role assignment that differs by gender um, in these teams. So men do more of the technical things um, in these teams. Uh, women are often assigned to the non-technical roles in the teams. Um, and so men and women uh, get differential benefits of participating in these teams. Um, so the teamwork, I think, is generally uh, a good thing. It has some positive outcomes on students' learning uh, and uh, other performance outcomes. But we have to think about what is happening in those teams. Uh, what are the dynamics? What are the relationships like between members of those teams? Um, are there ways that we can, uh, either as instructors, as um, sort of supervisors of teams are the things we can do to make sure that um, everyone is sort of getting equal benefits from participating and that's those are the kinds of things I've been thinking a lot about. That's great so I think you know earlier you mentioned you know some underlying social disparity is really some kind of social dynamics mm -hmm. while when we describe or when we observe this social disparity from a macro level but as you described, actually the devils are really in the details. Absolutely. So which means that this kind of project-based group learning experience, it might be a very good, conceptually, a very good design yeah. to address those kind of issues in, by encouraging interaction, mm -hmm. by encouraging self-motivated, yeah. right? So however, when you look into the, you know, the real outcome of the team task assignment, seems like you were able to even, at that level, observe some kind of disparity. Yeah, um, so in our teams, um, so we've done studies mostly with teams of undergraduate engineering students, um, and we've looked at um, sort of their performance on group tasks that they've worked on all semester long. Um, and the one nice thing um, in our approach is 
We have survey data from students, which is informative, but we also have objective behavioral data. So we videotape these teams, and we can go through and code the videos for who's doing what, and look at how that influences things over time. And the biggest um, outcome that um, we started with was looking at um, what's the implications for the students. Did, are they more likely to be retained in the College of Engineering, or do they drop out? Um, that's the first thing uh, we started, where we started. And yes, what they um, were finding is what students do in those early um, experiences, so how, what roles they adopt in their freshman year teams, um, does predict uh, retention um, over time. Did they stay in the college or not? And um, even for the ones that did stay, predicts their future intentions. Um, do they want to pursue careers in engineering, to pursue graduate degrees in engineering, or not leave the field altogether and, altogether and go do something else? That's one kind of um, real important outcome we've been looking at. But then we also have other studies where we've been looking at um, dynamics in the team um, and sort of the quality of the products that they create. Um, and there's some preliminary evidence so far by having um, objective raters who know nothing else about uh, what they're doing. Just watch this video, um, rate the dynamics on several outcomes, um, and talk about the quality of the performance. Those dynamics within the team influences the quality of the product that they create. Um, and we're not the only ones that are finding this. There's lots of work in complex systems that's been looking at this as well. Uh, Scott Page at the University of Michigan is another one who's um, been doing research in this area. Um, sort of what I'll touch on at the end of my talk today. Um, this is, these dynamics matter. The devil's um, in the detail, as you said. So. Well, thank you, uh, Neil. I think thank you for clarifying this. This kind of, you know, I, when you're talking, I really admire the work you're doing because you know, I'm a civil engineer. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when we try to study, okay, if I have a, like a beam, and then we want to find out oh, how much load a beam can support. Yeah. And when we change okay, in the beam, we can change how many steel bars we put in, yeah. what, kind of, what kind of grid of cement we use, yeah. what kind of gravels or sand we use. Yeah. And then we, we design these kind of different samples mm -hmm. with different combinations of these different materials, mm -hmm. and we put them into a lab, yeah. and we test their capacity, yeah. uh, right? Such that we find, oh, steel bar is number one factor affecting the capacity or the gravel yeah. is a number one so but you can see that for this kind of civil engineering study we are doing all these things in a very well controlled mm -hmm. environment if we say we put three bars yeah. steel bars we can put in however you know the work you are trying to uh, look into and the science you are trying to discover usually there are there's first of all there are so many factors <laughs> and uh, second, they are most of the time co-founded. Mm -hmm. And third, for you, it's really hard for you to conduct a controlled experiment, mm -hmm. right? Such that, so how do you discover and support or validate mm -hmm. causality uh, such that, you know, this you know, causal discoveries can be used to support policy mm -hmm. or measures. You know, it, it sounds to me it's really complicated. How did you do that? Yeah, um, this is a great question. And so um, I generally take a pretty mixed method approach um, to for the very reasons you're talking about. Some things uh, we you need those more controlled experiments to tease apart, um, and so we do it sort of a little bit of everything. So um, for the first uh, thing, I'll, this first study I'll talk about today, we conducted a longitudinal study because the question there was, how do these things unfold over time? Um, and so that's sort of the best method to answer that question, take a cohort of students, um, and sort of follow what happens over time. But then you write, um, you can find some correlations there, and those can be informative, but if you want to test, um, more directly the causal processes, you at some point have to bring students into the lab. And so we've done studies, uh, um, as I'll present one of them today, where we actually bring teams of students into the lab. So we recruit engineering students, um, bring them in four at a time, students that haven't worked together before, 
um, and have them uh, go through an exercise where we manipulate um, uh, what's going to happen and then have them interact with each other um, for an hour and a half and we videotape that entire interaction. Um, so there we can get at um, causal processes more directly. Um, and so with all of this, there's a, and so another method we've used in this work um, as well is conducting focus groups to get a more deeper experiential understanding from the students. And I think you need sort of all of these methods to really understand what's going on. So each one has its limitation, um, but together you can get a more holistic understanding of the processes. Um, one method might tell you one thing, but then not allow you to draw conclusions about another um, issue. Um, and another method might have the strength. So my laboratory studies um, are more limited in their external validity, but my longitudinal study gives me that, uh, right? And so by triangulating across these methods, um, you can get a more holistic understanding of the process. Yeah, I think it's, it, you know, that's actually, I think the beauty mm -hmm. um, of in-depth research, yeah. right? It takes time, takes effort, but it, and it deserves this effort mm -hmm. for to tease out yeah. the real uh, driving uh, dynamics underlying, you know, the social phenomena that we have been trying to, uh, trying to uh, tack into. So I think one thing is that I think you, um, you know, this question we are talking about is, you're talking about, you know, this even in the project team environment, the assignment, the task, in, you know, end up. So I'm just curious. So, for example, in my class, when I teach uh, this MH class, mm -hmm. and I do have a class um, team project requirement. Uh -huh. yeah. So, but in these things, my way of this uh, team format is really, you know, students, yeah. they voluntarily, mm -hmm. you know, they do things by themselves. You know, there is actually, there is, and of course, after form a team, how the tasks are assigned. It's actually, are, it's not assigned. You know, they through their team dynamics, mm -hmm. you know, they probably, you know, student take up the tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, they will probably feel comfortable they're good at. Mm -hmm. So that, that leads me to think about, you know, your, the measure, you know, the phenomenon observe, you say that even the task assignment doesn't turn out to be equally mm -hmm. beneficial to the team members. So when I was thinking along this line, so some kind of those kind of assignment could be due to like self choice. Mm -hmm. Like imagine you and we were in a team, yeah. right? We're working together. And Oliver, you know, if I'm working on some kind of project, because Oliver, you know, my expertise in the transport and air quality, I mean, I'll probably tend to pick up those things. Mm -hmm. And your expertise is on this communication, you'll probably tend to pick up. Those so which means that there's there's there is really no kind of an authority or something assigning things to us. It's really yeah. us mm -hmm. working equally yeah. to self choose yeah. uh, these things. So that's one thing kind of as that kind of detailed task allocation. I don't call assignment task allocation. Mm -hmm. So how how much of this kind of unequal benefit yeah. is due to you know our the way our system operates or due to kind of self selection or self choice because uh, and also another thing another question that we need to think about is you know, this is probably you know we can choose not to discuss this but I'm thinking with we have these words disparity equity and also difference or differentiation, mm -hmm. right? So I think from a society point of view, the best way to allocate tasks to specific people is best. It's really, I think the key is matching. Mm -hmm. Person A is good at doing this. Hopefully a task, a, you know, a task can be matched to him mm -hmm. that he does the best. And a person B, she's best doing that mm -hmm. and task can be matched to her. Yeah. So which means that you know, a, a socially optimal matching, mm -hmm. considering the advantages mm -hmm. or the strengths of different people, uh, will end up as an allocation with differentiation, mm -hmm. but not necessarily uh, inequity. 
So it, I know this is probably very sensitive yeah. or a big topic, yeah. but I it just this is just my thought. Can what what could be the difference between equity, disparity, and the difference? Okay, so I'll start we a little bit with discuss. your with yeah. your uh, first point because it's definitely related to this larger question. Um, so with the example of us working together. Um, there are clear differences in our expertise. So I know nothing about civil engineering, so you should obviously be the one that, if we're doing a project together, you should take that test, I should take the more communication or psychology tests. Um, in the teams that I've been studying, there's not yet uh, that expertise difference, right? So we're talking about first year engineering students, um, for the most part, um, in the studies that I'll talk about today. So everyone is sort of learning at the same time. Um, expertise is relatively equal, um, yet you're seeing these uh, patterns of differentiation start already. And when you ask students about why, so um, that's the second study I'll talk about today, is the focus groups. The reasons that um, they're even self-reporting is that they're assuming, sort of relying on uh, mostly gender stereotypes um, to make those allocations. Um, so the students will tell you um, that, well, they just assumed the guy would be better at it. And so that's why they, um, in their group, they decided he was going to do um, the technical thing. Um, and they just assume that the woman would like uh, the more organizational roles. And so they assign her to that. Sounds like, you know, <laughs> that's great. And I really like the way, like, kind of you start with people, they don't have any kind of technical yeah. expertise differentiation. Yeah. However, as you were saying, even technically or physically, they are like kind of uh, homogeneous yeah. sample. But as you say, because of the way they grew up, yeah. the environment, the, the country they grew up, so mm -hmm. could it be that kind of social biased concept or perception that is already coming oh, yeah. with I, people's... I think absolutely, that's a big part of it. We come in uh, with uh, sort of stereotypes about who is, who might or might not be good at different things, and that seems to be driving um, a lot of these early decisions. Um, and so, part of what the third study I'll talk about today, um, our laboratory experiment, was actually an attempt to, um, if you show a counter stereotype, counter stereotypical situation, what happens? Um, and in that study, um, as we'll see in a couple hours. Um, you can actually change behavior there. So um, the stereotypes that students are coming um, into the situation with does seem to matter um, and influence their behaviors, but it is possible to um, sort of create situations that might make them more or less likely to rely on those stereotypes. Um, so that's one of the things I've been thinking about. But um, to the broader question about differentiation, like um, absolutely, people with different skill sets uh, in an optimal, if we're going to optimize uh, an organization or the like, um, you should have people who um, are sort of using, assigned to roles where they're doing what they're best at. Um, but for at least so far in my work, that's not been the area that I've been looking. Um, it's from the very beginning, before we even get to that point, um, how are you, how are people being already assigned to these different roles when they're starting at the same uh, level? And that's, I think, something that schools have to think about, right? Um, so if you're having students come in that supposedly you're going to be teaching them all the same thing is how the curriculum is designed. You're not starting, uh, you know, students aren't starting here um, with the dean saying, okay, students from this group are going to learn topic X, students from this other group are going to learn topic Y. No, we're all teaching them all the same thing. So if they all have the same base of knowledge, why are we seeing such rapid, some, such rampant um, disparities in what they end up doing so early. Um, and this seems to matter um, over the course of their time here. For me as an engineer, like, yeah. you know, the way and also the discovery you have is really uh, you know, fascinating to me, I mean, mm -hmm. eye-opening. So, and I think in your program, right, I think 
as you wrote, your goal is to understand processes underlying social disparities mm -hmm. in order to better develop policies to address them. For example, some application areas including education mm -hmm. and uh, health disparities. Yeah. So, so what did you find out, uh, you know, from those kind of underlying processes? And uh, uh, I know, like as researchers, yeah. uh, right, we are encouraged uh, to generate academic value. Yeah. Um, for example, we write uh, <laughs> academic papers. Yeah. But I really appreciate that, you know, in your uh, statement, you want to better develop policies to address those social disparity problems. So have you been lucky or successful in kind of translating or bringing your research mm -hmm. into the policy arena where people adopt mm -hmm. or people build policies based upon what you find out? Can, do you have any examples? I'm just starting out. <laughs> uh, so. I uh, don't have a lot of experience yet in the policy realm, um, but in terms of immediate sort of broader impacts on work, um, I mean, I'm working with the College of Engineering here uh, to figure out things. Um, so some departments have more uh, of a gender imbalance issue than others, and so I've been working with the, um, the Center for Teaching Excellence or something like that um, here. Um, to think about what are some things that we can do. Um, and it's, it really bridges the academic and um, sort of applied sections. So we are not um, just sort of coming up with ideas that are sort of random. We uh, think about um, potential policies. We are running studies then to figure out whether or not they'd likely uh, be effective. Um, and so, sort of back and forth between the science and uh, practice. So that's, so that's something that's really encouraging, and um, that's more of the way that I um, approach sort of my, the policy side of my mm -hmm. researcher identity is there are many examples of things we thought would be good ideas uh, from a policy mm -hmm. uh, lens that end up not working until uh, end up not working. So I f feel very strongly that it's important to work together with um, policymakers and practitioners to make sure that interventions that um, end up being implemented are actually validated to um, achieve the desired goal. So it's, I don't think of them as, as separate issues as I think they're often described in academic circles. There's the research and the practice, I think some of the best work is actually done by working in tandem uh, to do both. I know that you have a you have this uh, very nice lab where you look at motivation mm -hmm. and uh, go pursuit. So especially I think kind of you study motivation and the go pursuit processes and uh, their implications mm -hmm. uh, for social disparities. Mm -hmm. I really like the way like and you are you are really working all the things from bottom up. You look at it very, at a very micro, mm -hmm. microscopic level. You look at individuals. You even kind of you know, video you know, videotape and keep track of their activity, right? Mm -hmm. So, so this is kind of I think from this kind of individual based microscopic uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So, so and then based on this, so what did you find out? I I imagine that right this social disparity, just as we you know we divide things usually as internal factors and external factors. Like when this kind of either individual success or individual um, benefit from the activities they do, that depends on how motivated that individual person is mm -hmm. and also how them, proactive. So this is what I understand as in, in individual internal factors okay. that affect, that of course in the end mm -hmm. contribute to the disparity that kind of self internal and also there are uh, other factors like external factors like mm -hmm. you know you talk about stereotype mm -hmm. uh, and that is probably created due to the external factors mm -hmm. and I really like the way on your website you show I don't know if the in front of the picture like I, I chose the, you know this oh, yeah. graph right oh, yeah. 
right? This graph you show in the middle, it's kind of identity-based motivation. Wow. And I think you do consider the social context, yep. right? So what did you find out? Like for this kind of social, of, cro of course, this is probably not easy to, to quantify them. However, like kind of, you know, there are social factors that are individual, you know, go seeking and the motiv motivated activity, internal, ex external. Mm -hmm. What roles do they play in driving, driving out or creating social disparity? Yeah, so this is a great question, then. Thanks for uh, asking it. Um, so we do often think about these things as separate, um, that they're, um, some people are motivated, others are not, um, but then separately there are these external things. The way um, I approach uh, my work is trying to figure out how these two seemingly separate things um, intersect. So, and there are ways um, of getting at that by doing seemingly macro level studies of micro processes. <laughs> so um, one, I'll give you one example. We did a study, um, it came out last year, where we did broad surveys of how um, people think about difficulty. Um, and specifically, is difficulty a sign that something is important? So does experiencing difficulty mean that um, success on a task is important? Sort of this no pain, no gain kind of mindset. Um, and we were interested in that because um, there's lots of evidence showing that the more people believe this, uh, the more they persist um, in the face of adversity. So what we wanted to look at, though, is are there broad differences in how people think about th these things. So we did a large survey of over a thousand Americans um, asking these questions. Um, we, so we have a scale of um, interpretation of difficulty as importance. So all of our participants answer this question. Um, and then what we're looking at is how does your answer depend on um, what you might think of as uh, different dimensions of social stratification. So level of education um, and race ethnicity were um, the two dimensions that um, we found to matter. Um, and that's, so the general finding is there's an effect of education. So higher people with higher levels of education are more likely to endorse this uh, mindset that's experiencing difficulties assigned of importance um, than people with lower levels of education. Um, and there's also um, an interaction with race, that racial ethnic minorities with higher levels of education are the most likely to endorse this mindset. Um, racial ethnic minorities with um, lower levels of education are the least likely to endorse this mindset. So that's one way of getting at this underlying psychological process with how is that influenced by sort of where you are in society. Um, and you know, this finding sort of made sense when you think about um, all the work on how people's lives are different depending on these sort of where they are in the social strata and so that's the way I've been sort of trying to bring these things together um, you can conduct very micro level studies um, all the way in the lab but you can also conduct bigger and bigger studies um, where you're drawing people from different um, walks of life um, to see how are they um, thinking about things differently um, and yeah, generally, how uh, are their motivational and psychological processes different as a function of um, the experiences they've had in life. And so I've been trying to bridge sort of this uh, macro and micro perspective and looking at um, the intersection in the middle. I really um, like your way looking at this problem. You can see that when I was asking that question, you can see that I was thinking in like a general public yeah. I divide these things, but I really appreciate you pointed out mm -hmm. it's really intersection. Yeah, they are interweaved together, yeah. uh, right? So, so which means that the solutions we are going to identify and rely upon will also need to be kind of a a mixed, uh, yeah. you know, systems systems approach. Absolutely. Uh, to doing that. So, so speak of that. So now, if we. Um, talk about like systems and engineering education, even though 
we call it uh, system, you know, we call our system engineering program. But you might know that last year we start since last year we started the PhD right. in systems, yeah. but we dropped the word engineering. Oh, I didn't realize that. Right, it's we call it PhD in systems. Okay. The official name is PhD in systems, because we realized, uh, especially in today's complex systems, mm -hmm. it's really hard or almost impossible for anyone or any uh, institution to address the system challenges without looking into social science, mm -hmm. psychology, of course, human factors, yeah. right? So that's why you know that um, system engineer has a very deep root mm -hmm. in military, right? right? So uh, World War One and World War Two, of course, one of the most famous system engineering project is Manhattan Project, right? right? So, but Cornell, since we started our systems program, uh, we have always kind of strategically positioned our program in a way that in addition to looking at you know the traditional system engineering field we really emphasize commercial systems mm -hmm. and a human centered systems yeah. that's why when we started our PhD program we 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 realized we don't want you know we don't have to include the word engineering we just yeah. said PhD in systems yeah. and which is definitely open to students with all kind of backgrounds, including social science. Yeah, yeah. So, so with that, and now we, if we come back, so you know you work with Professor Al George yeah. when you were undergrad, and then and then your approach is apparently a system approach. So, how from your point of view in your specific research area, mm -hmm. uh, what system elements or components or even systems thinking philosophies mm -hmm. that you feel are important and benefit yourself in your research mm -hmm. or in the meantime from your research area yeah. what kind of system needs or system challenge mm -hmm. that will help push the frontier mm -hmm. of a system of systems as a scientific disciplinary discipline it's a big question it is <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking more and more about, um, as you mentioned, these increasing uh, relations between humans and technology is sort of one area um, that I've, I'm starting to go in my research. So, um, you know, the studies we've talked about today, um, issues of disparities, they're now, we're now having to start to think about them um, differently as new technology um, emerges. So um, there are more and more studies coming out now about, well, how do algorithms um, uh, deal with bias biases differently? Um, some work I'm starting to do with, um, we have a computer science postdoc in the communication department um, that's been really been pushing our thinking about how might we use um, social media and other new technology to think about interventions uh, to address social um, system issues. And so I'm definitely very open to um, sort of broader ways of thinking about the, the topics that I study. I think um, one thing I like with the systems approach um, that I've always um, liked with it is um, really bringing people together from these different backgrounds to solve um, bigger issues. I think that really is the best way forward. Um, and so that's something I've always appreciated with systems since the, um, uh, my time as, as an undergrad with Al George. So, you know, we were on that team building a race car every year. Well, it takes many different uh, types of people and types of um, skills to do that effectively. Um, you know, the work that's done in the ergonomic sub team is very different than the work that's being done in the engine sub team. Um, and, you know, None of it would have been possible without uh, work on the business team to get the funding to do that, um, or um, managing relationships between the companies and the teams. Like so, you always need sort of a broad uh, skill set, um, broad set of perspectives um, to solve really any um, kind of big social pro uh, problem, and that's sort of the way that I've been thinking about. Um, my work as well. Um, so, 
you know, I work with graduate students in communication and psychology. Um, I we have a computer science postdoc there. I I'm very open to uh, people from a variety of backgrounds because that's the way that um, we come up with the best ideas. Uh, I mean, we're starting to work together now. Um, so that engineering perspective has been really beneficial in the way that um, we've been thinking about our health disparities issues. Um, and so that's what excites me most, is bringing together uh, teams of people with very different ways of thinking about things um, to try and work on uh, these social issues. I really like that, you know, can you point it out? So now with this kind of emerging of the new technologies, yeah. um, you're right, I think the impact to the society is really profound. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that will have important implications for the social disparity, yeah. right? So, but whether the impact will be, in which direction the impact will be? Uh, complete unknown. That's right, <laughs> it's complete unknown. So which yeah. means that it's a very exciting yeah. uh, research field. Yeah. So um, in particular, I think earlier you mentioned, I really like, it is approach of a longitudinal approach, yeah. right? And they, of course, you also mentioned dynamics, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there could be disparity 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and then there is disparity now. Yeah. And how, from 20 years ago, from that point, the society arrives at today's point. Right. Uh, and of course, beyond today's point, yeah. uh, where are we heading? Right. right. So I think there are so many things uh, that your research is right at the heart of addressing these interesting problems. And those uh, strategies are really um, instrumental for doing my research in the best way possible. I mean, even the studies um, that I talked about on following um, the students over time, um, one of the next directions I would like to take is um, getting much more finer grained data on these teams throughout the course of the semester, right? So we mm -hmm. have few data points right now um, in that first year. Um, and the data that we have is, I mean, in some sense, it's amazing how uh, well it predicts uh, these outcomes years later. Uh, but I do need, uh, going forward, more finer grain data on what is happening in all of these meetings the time um, when these students are meeting throughout the course of the semester um, to figure out to get a better understanding of um, how these uh, things emerge. And so um, I, I think technology is one way to um, start getting at that, um, but there are potentially many other approaches that I uh, haven't yet thought of or don't know of yet. Um, and getting other people who have those expertise would be very beneficial for advancing that. You know, of course, you know, in this seminar series, we have a lot of speakers who have the, an inner background, but you, mm -hmm. you as, a, you know, a, a social scientist and a social psychologist, mm -hmm. uh, from your experience and also, what would you say to our system and inner students? I don't have a lot of background on what happens within the program right now, but one thing that's um, always stuck with me um, I think probably from Al George is the first person that told me this, but most of the, uh, or a lot of the big engineering problems are human problems, <laughs> right? That's uh, true, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. And so it's important to really think about uh, these human elements um, as you are developing new systems, thinking about uh, ways of implementing these systems into organizations. Um, you can't really uh, build, um, good systems without thinking about the humans that are going to be within those systems. So I guess that's uh, the message I would have. I would leave um, with the system students. I think that's, that's a very important message because engineers are trained most you know, a time so well in doing things right. However, and I think kind of better understanding human factors that can help people think about what the right thing is yeah. for a very good engineer to do. Yeah. Right. I think that's that, I think that's a very important <laughs> advice. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you.